The one thing about Seattle is they always want to talk about love and peace and it's a gay city, but it's like to Beautiful Minds and Where Is Neva collaboration. Yes. Beautiful Minds is solely dedicated to art, mental health, and self-care. And it's mainly dedicated to breaking stigmas that are associated with mental illnesses and making people feel more comfortable about yes. talking about mental health yes. and about talking about their diagnosis. You shouldn't be scared to talk about it. I have anxiety or, oh my God, I'm so depressed. No, we're gonna talk about it. Like, what are you going through? Beautiful Minds is about sharing resources mm -hmm. to help one another. It's about a journey and it's about learning your journey. Yes. And yes. we all have our own journeys in life. I'm just very, very, very passionate about mental health because I have my own journey and my own story about behind mental health. I became empowered because I'm able to control my mind and I'm able to control myself. And I'm able Because there's a power when you're like, okay, I know what's happening and I'm not about to let it happen like that. I'm about to control this and I'm about to take care of it. Whereas if you're powerless over your own mind, you do, that is just the worst feeling. Yes, and so yes. with Beautiful Mind, the whole mission is to break the stigma and to normalize mental illness and normalize seeking help, yes. especially in the black communities. Finding mental illness in the black community has been something that's not normalized. It's like, you crazy, or you got this and that going on. It's like- You can pray about it. Yeah, pray <laughs> about it. But it's like, see, you also can do the spiritual work, but you have to do the physical work too. And you can't just do one or the other. You know, you know what I mean? The beautiful mind, I just want to really normalize the conversation surrounding mental illness in our community. Mm -hmm. And I really want to normalize seeking help and yes. knowing that it's okay to seek help. I want us to also find our beauty in our mental illnesses because is it really it. an illness, you know? It's, I feel like it's an illness when you don't know how to have a remedy, you know what I mean? And like my remedy for my, my um, anxiety, my depression has been art. And the things that I have created when I'm having an anxiety attack, the things that I have written when I'm depressed has helped so many other people mm -hmm. and has been healing for me. Mm -hmm. like. Oh, I got that out. It feels so good. And if I didn't have depression and if I didn't have an anxiety attack, would I have been able to produce this? Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, is it really so bad? Mm. It's only bad when you have no control. It's only <laughs> bad when you don't have an outlet. It's only bad if it's misplaced. Mm. And I think that's where the stigmas are associated with that. You know I what I mean? I love it. I love it. I love how we both have platforms that's educating yeah. and supporting mental health, you mm -hmm. know, especially black mental health. So Where Is Neva is a multimedia platform supporting, inspiring, and loving on our black truth through storytelling. And with that, we focus on five pillars. Where are you physically, mentally, financially, romantically, and artistically? Yeah. And within those pillars, we have our open diary, which is raw, authentic truth, you know? Like, we, we don't like talking about that truth, truth. You know, that diary truth, you yeah. know? We always have to censor ourselves. Yeah. And so, we is even a space where we can share that authentic truth. And then we have guidance, which is tips and tricks and tools to help you on your transparency journey. So, like, I created a guidance post about six ways to protect your mental health. Mm. Um, and then we have our support system, which is the directory of mental and physical wellness experts globally who are mm. African descent, who mm. are doing the work. Because we don't talk about that either. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how mental health in the black community is not just only in the United States. Mm. When I went to Africa, I seen it there. And I seen it in Brazil. I seen it in different places. Mental health as a whole affects the world. Yeah. But when we talk about my community, Oh, we getting that shit together. It's, it's our duty to do that yeah. because our ancestors did so much to get to where we are today. We would be 
it would be a hot mess to not do more. Yeah. And they didn't have the resources we have today. No. They didn't have therapy. They didn't have life coaches, um, physical trainers and stuff like that. So it's time to get our life so that we can build the generations beyond. Generational yeah. wealth. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's really nice that younger generations are doing it because we can also teach our older generations. I talked to my aunt about... I see you should get yes. you, you should go get a therapist yes. or if this is going on maybe have you talk, thought about grief counseling I've had my aunts and my grandmother even say it you know baby maybe you're right I never thought about that and that's beautiful because you don't have to suffer not at all you, there's there's not at so all. many resources now not it's all. not it's not like it was before and we have to also understand that this trauma has been it's been birthed in us yeah it's in the womb since before slavery days, okay? Yes. It doesn't just, just disappear. Right. Yeah, <laughs> Slaves made kids that turned into our great, great grandmother. Great, yeah. great. You yeah. know, that's exactly. not that long ago. It's not. <laughs> and we're not even talking about slavery. We're talking about, we talk about the civil rights movement. The segregation. Oppression, the segregation, the that. oppression of how, how our black brothers are, what they've gone through. And, and that's we, still happening today. Exactly. So yes, definitely. And check into Beautiful Minds as she shares yes. her story through her art. Thank you. And, and check into Where is Neva? Yes, as we share our story because <laughs> she's going to be featured on there too. She is featured on there. So yeah, we got to continue to do the work. Cool. And it's a process. Is not, it is. I don't believe there's a such thing as healed. I oh, think no. it's always learning and growing and yeah. processing. Assessing. Honestly, I don't think I'm ever going to not need my therapist. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, we go not codependency. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, but I feel like you, I think everyone deserves a guide. Hell yeah. It's not like, Hell not yeah. as like, oh, I need, I need to, no, we're going to gain the tools and yes. be able to yes. heal ourselves. However, I always going to need that guidance. And yes, it's always okay to have yes. a guide through life because yes. there's going to be some things that you don't know about. It's like, oh, whoa, let me talk to somebody about this. I need a mentor, my spiritual mentor, you know, some type of guidance. And that's why I said I feel like I'm always going to need that because I'm always going to be growing and evolving. Things are going to change. Definitely. Things are going to come at me that I didn't know about, you know. Definitely. Things are going to come out of me that I didn't know about. And you're going to always need some someone with you as you grow and evolve and develop. Yes, so, yeah. I love it. <laughs> so talking about arts, mm -hmm. what, how did art find you? Um, art found me and I wait was, before you tell mm -hmm. tell us what is your artist medium what okay yeah it? I'm a visual artist so I use acrylic paints I call these anything I can find to create visual pieces of work and then um, I'm a musician so yes. I write music too I write music about my journey about things I'm going through and I'm a poet I started off writing poetry first that was my first when I was younger, I would write poetry about what I was going through, not even realizing that that was a form of expression when I was younger. But then that transferred over into music. So I create music, poetry, and visual art. I've always been artistic, but I didn't really realize I was artistic. I just always liked art. Like, that was my favorite subject in school, everything. I ended up falling into a really deep depression in, like, 2017. And I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder and anxiety. When I got my diagnosis, I was so relieved, like, oh, so this is what it is? Mm. So I'm not crazy? My nerves ain't bad? Mm. Something wrong with me? <sighs> okay, so now what? <laughs> like, what do I do now? Is it like, do I take a pill? Do I, what do I do to get rid of this? And it's like, well, there's so many different options. And I finally found a therapist, African-American woman, and she taught me art therapy. And yes. when we would sit down through our sessions, she said, have you ever thought about using art? you know, to express your feelings. And like, so we would talk about certain things and then she said, pick a crown or, or a color associated with that emotion, draw it here. And I would be in the session crying like, and drawing these pictures. And then after it, I look at, look at the piece like, oh my God, I can't believe I just, I just made that. Mm -hmm. But it was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. So my therapist introduced me to that. When I would have anxiety attacks or feel anxious, I would just sit down and I would paint through my anxiety and pain, you know, but I would always try to use bright colors because I didn't want to display the dark colors. Even mm. though the feelings are dark, I would try to use the most, the brightest colors. If I'm feeling really, really bad, you can get a real bright painting. So I would just start creating all these works of art and a friend of mine, seeing one of my pieces and was like, wow, this is beautiful. 
this looks like you were kind of conflicted right here the way this wow. and i was like that's exactly how i felt because <laughs> i could tell by the way the strokes of the brush were it's like you didn't really okay like, and i was like yeah that's exactly how i felt i was conflicted about a decision that i had to make and that's why i painted this she goes you should sell your work and i was like sure i'm gonna buy my stuff and she's like no you should sell your work. Mm -hmm. I went to some local art shows here and people start buying my art and I was shocked. Like, but that boosted my confidence. Look at these people looking at my art and loving it. And like, mm -hmm. I see them look at my paintings and go, wow, wow. And they look at it and I'm like, you have no idea what I was going through when I painted that. And I'm so happy that there's some, that you see the beauty in that. Yeah. That's why I created the channel Beautiful Minds. I love it. Because <laughs> that no matter, like my mind was going through so much. Yeah. Beauty came yeah. from that. Whoa. You know? Yeah. Okay. So that's how I started my visual art journey, like literally through therapy. But my poetry, I've always used poetry. Like that has been my, since I was younger, that was my my main form of expression. I love writing. I love putting words together. Like sometimes I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I'd wake up with a heavy feeling. I'd go on my phone and just start writing. Mm -hmm. And after I'm done writing, I feel so much better. Like a weight has been lifted off my shoulders. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> it makes me feel so good. Like if I could just do art all day, and that, that's all I want to do. I don't want to do anything else. I want to teach other people how to do art. I want to do art. I want to sing. I want to make music. I started doing a spoken word here in Washington. There's like some speakeasies that a friend of mine used to host. I remember like I was so afraid to, to share a poem about um, abuse. I was in an abusive relationship and I was really afraid to share a poem about that mm -hmm. that I wrote. But when I shared that poem, I, I ran off the stage right after I was done sharing it. I ran to the bathroom to hide because I was like, I can't just tell these people what I went through. They're going to judge me. When I left the bathroom, a girl came up to me. She said, I have a protective order in my purse right now from someone who has been abusing me. Thank you. Mm. Thank you mm. for sharing that. Wow. You make me feel strong. And then she start coming to all of my art. Anything I did that was poetry, she would bring her friends and she would come. So then I realized the beauty in that. Mm. Like, okay, not it's not for me. This is for y'all. Hello. That's what I realized. Hello. And that's why I, that's when I was like, okay, now I want to make music. Yeah. Because music can reach so many so many people. I have an EP that's dropping on the 20th and it's called Therapeutic Music, January 20th. It comes out, Therapeutic Music. Yes, yes. Check yes. that out on all platforms. Drop <laughs> uh, it. Say it again with it. It's Therapeutic Music, okay. Search Art Bay, A-R-T-B-A-E. That stands for Arts Before Anything Else. Okay. Search that on all platforms to find Therapeutic Music. I have a song about anxiety, about my depression, everything. Everything I went through, it's literally... Uh, the whole EP talks about my journey through healing and everything I went I through. I love it. Yes. So, um, yes. so as I heal, <laughs> as I'm healing, yes. you're healing with me. Yes. So we're healing together. Okay. I want to keep bettering myself and healing myself so I can help others heal as well. And that's my main mission. So I want to do. We have to have our minds healed, keep our minds strong. I love it. Yeah, so that's how I found art. Like I said, it really found me. And that's who I am now. I am Art Bay. Art before anything else. That is so cute. I love it. I love it. I love the meanings behind all of that. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I know that I'm not the only artist at this time. Because <laughs> that's how we met. That we did. We met at an art show. That's right. Yeah, we and were both selling art. One of the pieces of yours that I love so much is the piece where you took all the the, the, the dried paints yes. that you had and you made Africa in the middle. Yes. It was like Africa, it was just the concept of taking things that people wouldn't use, things that are discarded. Yeah. That's what I looked at. Like, wow, she took the pieces that are always that are discarded. Who uses the dried pieces of paint? And to put this together and make that that something so beautiful like that. Yeah, um, that piece is called Africa is the Universe. Yes. Yeah. So tell me, so am I, is that how you made it? Did you take dried pieces? Yeah, I did, it? and I collected it. And tell me a little bit about that. So, Why did you decide to use pieces that would be normally thrown away? <laughs> yeah, so um, I call myself a revolutionary mm -hmm. abstract artist. Mm -hmm. So I like lose, using stuff that I just find and I create. Like I, I created um, a piece with this woman that says protect black women and mm -hmm. hair that I use in braids before and I, I made it as a ponytail. Um, I created, a, I did an illustration for someone and I used 
kente cloth from Africa where I just put it everywhere on her paintings and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I'm, I'm all about recycling, you know, right. because to keep the world <laughs> the way the world needs to be, we have to continue to use stuff that we usually throw away, mm -hmm. you know, and I feel like that goes to goes with how we treat people and the mm -hmm. reason why i do africa is a universe is because so many people have stole so much from africa yes talk about still it still to this they day still, they are still stealing and from <laughs> africa and we, we don't realize like before i went to africa the first time i didn't realize how the world would not be what the world is without africa mm-hmm Africa it literally is a universe. Yeah. And so me keeping my pieces, I literally, I don't have a vision before I create. I just allow myself to create. Mm. I don't tell myself to do, like I'll go um, in the backyard and I start throwing paint. And mm -hmm. that's what I did at the um, bottom of Af Africa's universe. I just threw paint everywhere. And then I just build and I just think and I just vibe with my paintings. Cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just you, vibe. you have music playing or what, what's no. your environment like when you're working? Um, I really like silence. Hmm. Yeah, I allow my intuition just to talk to me. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's powerful to watch. It's, I it's just, I love my intuition. And I, that's another thing people sometimes want to ask. I'm like, uh, this is me time. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I just let my intuition talk to me and I just create and I create layers. And if I want to make the painting even darker, I'll just do layers and layers. And I don't tell myself what I can't do. Right. I just continue just to do until yeah. I'm like, step back and say, I'm satisfied. I'm okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And that's like, I don't really like um, commission pieces because it takes away from that. It seems like a commission piece, a person already has an idea of what they want. Yeah. And you don't get to just let your intuition exactly. speak so much. Is that one of the reasons why? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And also, all my I'm a writer as well and a poet. And so all of my paintings have stories. Mm -hmm. You know, either not really about how I'm feeling, but I have a piece where it's called, I don't know, I, it's entitled, but there's a church, there's a prison, and then there's a school. Mm. And I painted a target practice on the the prison. And they're, <laughs> they're all connected. And then I have a um, upside down American flag. And then I have the stars coming off of it. Mm. And the stars have initials. So mm. like Michael Brand, mm. um, Michael Brown, Sandra Bland, and just mm. different things. And then I have some that say dot dot. And then I have Africa in the corner. Yeah. And from Africa, there's like black people with prison uniform on yeah. so it's just like I allow myself because I'm also um, I went to school for criminal justice I wanted to be a civil rights attorney oh wow and so I didn't I, know that <laughs> yes and so I allow myself and my community to talk through my paintings and that's why I call myself a revolutionary abstract artist because I throw paint around I move it around and I create stories this piece that's untitled Around what time did you create this piece? It was some years ago. Years ago. Yeah, yeah. So, so before everything that's even going on is happening now, you kind of were already working on... Six. Yes. I've been working on stuff like this... For the longest. Since high school. I started oh. the first Black Student Union at my high school. I used... When I was a kid, my stepdad used to have me watching documentaries after documentaries after documentaries just to know how proud i should be as a black That's person right. in the what we've been through yeah so me going to school i wanted to be a lawyer i didn't know what type of lawyer but i was bsu president then i turned out to be the first black student or first black female student body president at that school so i was about to listen i was like we about to show the fuck out okay mm -hmm. but art allowed me to use my voice mm. um in those roles in white places it stripped my voice a lot mm -hmm. like I know when I went to university I had a white professor tell me that I went to his office hours and he told me that he wouldn't take me as a student that would come to him after class wait I'm sorry repeat that <laughs> he said he wouldn't take me as a student that would come talk to him after class it was me and another black person in that class I also 
I had another woman who had her name on one of our buildings of the school tell me that being a black woman just doesn't do it anymore. And I was the student body president at that school. So, and then I wrote a paper. Um, my senior thesis was about police bias in Washington State. And they did not like that at all. They did not approve my thesis. They didn't want me to share it with the school. So when this stuff started happening during the pandemic, it made me so livid. It pissed me off because I've been doing this work for so long and we had to sit in quarantine to have conversations like this that needed to have. You know, it's just like, it feels, it's like, there's no such pain as being numb to seeing people on the screen being killed off that look like you over and over and over again. So it's like when I when I paint and I go to these art shows, it was a perfect time to use my voice. So because we were in Washington and there's a lot of white people, they would come to my table. And I'm like, do you know Tamar Rice? <laughs> yeah. Do you know Mike Brown? Do you know these people? I have this painting where um, it's Tommy from Red Rats. I know. I, I, love that one. <laughs> I painted him black. Mm -hmm. And he the has a shirt that says, I am Tamar Rice. And people look at that and it's like, what does that mean? And I say, and it gives me time to tell the story of Tamar Rice. Yeah, can you use some tissue? My eyes are burning. In the bathroom. It gives me an um, opportunity to explain who Tamar Rice is. We didn't grow up with cartoon characters that are black, that look like this. That's right. And so when I painted these cartoon characters that I used to watch, I painted them black because this is not what I ever seen. Mm -hmm. And Tamar Rice was a black child who got shot by a police officer playing with a toy gun. Yeah. <laughs> playing as a kid. Being a kid. Doing what kids do. Thank you. Doing what kids do, and he got shot by a police officer. So I use my art so I can talk to people about their stories. Because their stories matter to me. Their stories are me. You know what I'm saying? That is why I go so damn hard. Because to be numb, to be numb, that ain't human. That ain't human. And I remember at I, I, one of the shows, this white woman came up to me and she asked me a question and she just was like, no, so what does this mean? And I was ready. <laughs> I was ready. And so I told her, it was the piece of where I told you about the church and stuff like that. And there's a reason why I did the church, the prison, and the school by because terrorist, terrorism happens there too. People go to churches and shoot up the churches. Yeah. But really, this prison system is making so much money off of my black skin. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's where the target practice needs to be. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Oh, shit. You guys have to make me go. But no, no it's oh, like... Please, we need to You come. know, we have to. Capitalism is literally the reason why we continue to be in the same situation that we're in. And so... When she came to the same and I told her, and she was like, mm, that's okay. And like walked off. She didn't get it. She did. That's the mm. problem. She got it, but she was irritated. Mm. That I showed up as my authentic self. Because I was fucking tired to be in places and spaces where they didn't want to hear my voice. Mm. Like after I told the president of the school about, as, as the student body president, of what that woman said to me who has her name on the building and how she told me. Was she a white woman? Yes. About how a black woman doesn't do it anymore. And this was after I told her I wanted to go to law school. And she was like trying to ask me like how I'm going to pay for it. And so, because um, she was saying <laughs> that I, they're not, I'm not going to get scholarships and all that stuff because, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway. You got to be more than just black is what she's trying to say. Oh, so, like the dean of students and the president of my school. You know what they tell me, Shakira? What they tell you, sis? Shh. <laughs> because their money is way more important than my voice. They wanted me there. They wanted to use me. I went to so many. 
I was a part of, I gave, I got them so much money, so much money by speaking at different events, by sharing my story. But sharing my story raised so much money. That year was like one of the years that they made the most money off of um, a gala. And they told me to hush. And after I graduated, they went hush. <laughs> they were nowhere to be found. I'm and so then, sorry. I mean, that's when I, like, lost my father. and Just a whole bunch of stuff started happening. And so, like, when this started happening with the pandemic and all the stuff, it made me live it that I had to, like, step away. And I was just like, I don't want to do. And it, what makes me even more upset it ain't just the white folks that make me upset. It's people that look like me. That now want to open their eyes. Now they got 2020 vision in 2020. Act as if this didn't happen before. Like this is new. George Floyd ain't the first one. No. No. <laughs> this has been happening way before Eminem too. But it's not. My thing is, I wonder, is it new to them? Or is it because... We have allies they feel comfortable and it's like, okay, now we can talk about it. I believe that that could be one of the issues because we didn't know it was okay to be black and have a voice. Mm. But now that white people are standing with us, now we're like, oh, okay, it's okay now. Are we? I know one thing when I was in um, school, I wrote my um, paper in Washington about police bodies in Washington State. Someone, a white, somebody white was like, nah, you, this, this ain't real because this doesn't happen in Washington. And I said, but I literally did a snowball sample, meaning these are people that I've actually talked to that can vouch for this shit. And you're going to say that is not true yeah, because but... Washington is passive aggressive. Very. You know, it's Very. not like the South where they will come and call you the N-word. They say the N-word behind your back. Or they will say, I don't take you as a student that come to me after class. You know what I'm saying? And that was a whole month. Yeah. So that, that says a lot about what they see and how they view you or value you. I, You know, I'll tell you, I agree with you that Washington is passive. I've had some experiences here. I was in uh, Redmond. And I went to a um, boutique over there. And... You know, I've never had this incident, and maybe I have had stuff like this happen to me before. I, you know, but it wasn't until this incident where I had looked back at everything in my life and I realized how many times this had got brought up to me, and I did not, I was oblivious to it. Mm. I'm in a store, and it was Asian run, Asian owned, and I'm in this boutique, and I go to, I'm getting ready to pick out an outfit, and you, you were there with me, right? And mind you, I was working at a bank downtown Seattle at the time, making money. I was working two jobs, you know. But I went in there on one of my off days, and I looked like I had like a track suit on, like I was working out type stuff, you know. How old were you? 23, 24, I think so. When I went in there, I went to go. I was trying to hurry up and get some stuff because I was going to go out with some friends that night. And so I'm picking out an outfit, you know, and I go to try on my outfit. And then I went to get some shoes for my outfit. And... But Redmond is a very uppity area, so I'm seeing all these white people go in there and try on their stuff, and then they come out and they go finish shopping. As soon as I come out of the dressing room and I get ready to go try to find shoes and other accessories to go with the outfit I just tried on, an Asian lady meets me right there and tries to grab my stuff and says, I'm going to put this at the front for you. And I said, why do you want to put my clothes at the front? Oh, because, um, you know, I need to protect my store. I said, well, wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> I need to still find other things to match with my outfit. I want to get shoes. I want to get accessories. I just tried it on. I like it. I'm going to go get other accessories. What are you talking about? Well, you can leave it at the front because I have to protect my store. I said, from what? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, sometimes people come in and then they take things. They'll look, they try on stuff and then they run out the store. I said, so why don't you ask this white girl and all these other people right. to put their things at the front? Why are you only asking me to put my belongings at the front? Right. I just need to protect my store. That's all she kept saying. I have to protect my store. Next thing I know, I said, I'm not putting my things at the front. Goodbye. And I just kept going on with my business. And then I hear her get on the phone and says, I need to see you down here. I just want to see you. Can you please come down? Who's she talking to? Oh. She's on the phone. I look up, security's down there. And I said, did you call security on me? 
because I didn't want to put my things at the front. And the security guard just watching me, following me around the store. She was with me when it happened. I couldn't believe that. I was so upset. I'm like, do you know where I work? I probably make more money an hour than you do at this place. You're gonna call security on me? It's because I'm a black woman and you think I'm gonna steal your items. You think I'm the type of people that run up out of here. And that hurt me so bad. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it. And then after that happened, it was like a light switch came on and I thought about all the other times stuff like that happened to me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is not the first time this has happened. Wow. This has been happening to me. And then it just hurt to think about all those things that I just dismissed and that, uh, and I didn't stand up for myself at those times. And I just let it happen, you know? And Seattle's very passive. Very. That ain't passive at all. No, that wasn't. <laughs> but I thought about all the yeah, other things no. that happened yeah. that were passive. And I just went for like, oh, fuck this. I'm gonna stand up for myself anytime something like this happens. Like, this is not cool. So after that experience, I realized like, wow, that's how it feels. Mm. What are my other brothers and sisters going through every day? I can't believe this has happened to me. I can't believe that. That has never happened to me before. Or has it happened to me before and I just didn't see it? Mm. Has it happened to me in subtle ways and I didn't realize, you know? And after that, I was hyper vigilant. Like, okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> What'd you say? Yeah. Say. <laughs> what? It's because I'm what? Ah, uh, that's a little racist. Like, you know, I, and I'm, I'm calling people out on it, you know? And then they get uncomfortable when you call them out because, oh, I don't want to, I don't, I'm not racist. I'm not. Okay, you know what? You don't have to be a racist, but you're prejudiced. You have a preconceived notion about me because of the color of my skin. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Just like that woman had a preconceived notion about me. She thought I was going to steal because I, my skin is black. No, that was racist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to give people the benefit of the doubt. No, that was racist. And I feel like due to slavery and colonization, a lot of people are. And yeah, they yeah. don't claim that they are. But... It's, it's, it's red in them. They can't help it, though. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm.